Hi everybody, it's Michael. It probably goes without saying that we work really hard to bring you episodes of Scotland as regularly as we can, but that comes at a cost in terms of time and of money. Uh, so I'm really sorry that we're going to be these people, but we've set up a Patreon for anybody that fancies helping us out uh, by throwing us a few quid every month. It'll help with hosting costs, keeping us in the lavish lifestyle of yachts and champagne that we're accustomed to, and other, well, okay, just the hosting costs. I mean, really. Um, there's no pressure, but if you like the show and you feel like it's worth a wee bit of money to you, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Scotland History Podcast and do what feels right to you. Um, we want to keep Scotland ad free and to be supported by you, our awesome listeners. You're honestly all brilliant and your generosity and positivity really keeps us going. Um, if you're not able to help out, then you know the usual way to help. It's get in a lift and shout about how much you like Scotland or alternatively just put it on social media. Let's not be too weird. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and that's not true. What doesn't kill you can destroy you. What doesn't kill you can weaken you until you beg for the sweet release of death. That was often true for those who sailed from British ports, bound for tropical climes in the New World. Those who made it there, there were rarely that many, would find their new homes infested with things that were either evolved to kill pink, soft, fleshy idiots from the land of pink, soft, fleshy idiots who thought they had a God-given right to overrun the entire world. Or they would find their new homes full of things that were evolved to do irreparable damage to pink, soft, fleshy idiots. What doesn't kill you will probably try again. If it doesn't kill you, it'll kill everyone else. If only there was some way to live in a tropical idyll without having to worry about disease or the pesky locals. It is 1812, and as Brigadier General Gregor MacGregor, you didn't mishear that, looked out over his bedraggled troops, he probably wasn't thinking too much about hopeful British colonists. After all, he's a long way from Edinburgh where he was brought up. The battlefields of Venezuela seem pretty far away from trading bits and pieces of mirrors and coins in some coastal backwater. He wears a full military dress uniform, which stood out like a sore thumb against the soldiers of his unit of Francisco de Miranda's Republican army. The Spanish were intent on destroying the uprising, but Miranda had been the toast of society on a recent visit to London, and that had given the flamboyant British army captain, who had taken to calling himself Colonel around Edinburgh, an idea. If he took what he knew, he could make a name for himself fighting in Venezuela and come home to Scotland to great renown. Gregor MacGregor wants nothing more than to be famous. He wants to be the toast of the town. Even back in Edinburgh, he rolled around in a lavish carriage, wearing dress uniform and the insignia of a Portuguese knight, an order descended from the Knights Templar. He was tempted to stay in Kingston, Jamaica, where many Scotland stories seem to either begin or end or end up in a shipwreck, but nobody would have him. Nobody knew his name. It is 1812 and I'm telling you that Gregor MacGregor, who was a captain in the British Army before he pretended to be a colonel and then was made an actual general because he made a flamboyant plea to a desperate revolutionary leader in South America, that he was obsessed with his own image. Because what doesn't kill you sometimes does make you stronger. The revolutionary government in Venezuela was about to collapse and Gregor MacGregor was about to make a break for the Dutch island of Curaçao. From Be Quiet Media, this is Scotland, a podcast about history and the places we made it. I'm Michael Park. People liked Gregor MacGregor, a man whose name is so satisfying to say it's almost impossible not to say it in its full entirety every time. In fact, just pause this for a second and try it. Gregor MacGregor. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Anyway, moving on. He was a professional soldier and for the time was the very definition of flash and pizzazz. He got bored easily, and living quietly in Curaçao was the very definition of boring. For the next eight years, Gregor MacGregor bounced around the Americas, offering his services to anyone who was trying to give Spain a bloody nose. If you had a Republican uprising, you were trying to get off the ground, and it was only a matter of time until a Scotsman turned up in a full-dress uniform, 
claiming to be a Portuguese knight and a direct descendant of a Darien scheme survivor. He was probably going to offer to help you out. He fought in New Grenada and was part of the defence of Cartagena. He went back to Venezuela and led a retreat of hundreds of men over hundreds of miles. He managed, possibly by accident, to rout the Spanish army by using a marsh as a trap. He deployed archers on the other side and watched as the charging Spanish cavalry collapsed into the bog and caught arrow after arrow for hours until Gregor MacGregor's men charged and sent the army that had been following them for weeks packing. That was where Gregor MacGregor had gained notoriety. He had finally proved his worth as a military commander, and the chattering classes in Kingston, Jamaica, were suddenly quite willing to throw open their dining rooms for this exotic hero, to regale them with tales of his staggering military prowess. They called him the Hannibal of modern Carthage because of his single-handed defence of Cartagena. They toasted him and they drank to his many military successes, There hadn't been that many staggering military successes, but Gregor MacGregor had realised something. Now that the posh parlours of Kingston, Jamaica believed one story, they'd believe them all. Gregor MacGregor was learning. The best lies contain a kernel of truth. A couple of years later, 1820, and MacGregor surfaces in the court of King George Frederick Augustus of the Mosquito people. The Mosquito were descended from indigenous people who had had families with shipwrecked African slaves. Gregor MacGregor was popular with the Mosquito, since they didn't have a lot of time for the Spanish, and he was renowned for shooting at them every chance he got, even if he wasn't very good at it. It didn't hurt Gregor MacGregor that the king of the Mosquito wasn't really a king at all. The British had claimed the land decades ago and had elevated the Mosquito tribal leaders to be kings so that the lands couldn't be claimed by Spain. In reality, they very much belonged to the British crown. Sneaky, sneaky. The king liked Gregor MacGregor. Everyone liked Gregor MacGregor. Whether they thought he was a military mastermind or a blithering idiot, everybody seemed to have a lot of time for him. In late April of 1820, the king signed over a portion of the Mosquito Coast to the Scots colonel with the flamboyant fashion sense and questionable military record. The area was about the size of Wales and was, for lack of a better term, kind of rubbish. It would look nice in an oil painting, but the ground was swampy, the jungle dense, the fauna aggressive, and the diseases tropical. But it was Gregor MacGregor's. All of it. If you like Scotland and you want to tell somebody about it, um, that would be great. It it really helps. This was going to be a better advert. That's kind of it. Like, it really, really does help when somebody comes out and says, I'm listening to Scotland. I really like this episode. You should listen to it too. Thanks very much. It is 1822, and you are hushed into silence by your host as you quaff the last swig of wine from your glass at one of London's most fashionable tables. The guest of honour is reintroduced and you sit up and take notice as this man in full military regalia with some kind of Knights Templar badge has the help pass out massive books to everybody. You'd expect a dessert, maybe a nice queen cake, they bake them in the shape of hearts and everything. Instead, here you were with a 300-odd page book in front of you, and a man beginning to effort vests with stories of his wild military exploits. You're not that impressed. You're one of the only people at the table who had read Mr. Rafter's biography of the man, and knew what a pompous incompetent he was. As you look round the table, it's clear that everyone else is very impressed indeed. The man, this Gregor MacGregor, has everyone wrapped around his little finger. He's not even at the good part yet. He's not even reached the kicker. The stories of his military genius are exaggerated beyond belief, but a little bit of parlour trickery never hurt anyone. People always embellish their stories a bit at parties. You didn't think you'd heard your host right when they'd introduced him. Something about being a cassock of poison? 
Cacique of Poyet, he says as if he'd been reading your mind the whole time. He spins some yarn about the famous and noble kings of the Mosquito Coast before he begins to tell you about the incredible, simply incredible, opportunities available to colonists in this land of Poye, which he was lucky enough to be leader of. You began to see yourself living in the land he described. It was like a warm, tropical version of Britain. The locals were friendly, even to the point of genuine, genuine love for the British. The harvests were bountiful. You could get as many as three maize crops a year. The rivers ran with water so clear you could see the hunks of gold that rumbled around on their bed. The people of the Caribbean used Poye as a health spa, such was its agreeable climate and natural beauty. The cacique of Poye described the thriving capital, St. Joseph. It was all sprawling boulevards and well-appointed mansions. It even had a theatre. He tells you that the settlement is criminally overlooked by most people in Europe, a real land of opportunity for those with the sense to invest. He references the Darien Scheme, the cautionary tale of Central American expansion, and explained to his enraptured audience that Poye was different. Poye was special. There weren't even any tropical diseases in Poye. There were no mosquitoes either. All MacGregor needed to turn Poye into a thriving port of the fledgling empire was a bit of financial support from clever investors like the ones sitting around this table. He told them that they didn't have to decide there and then. Their host had already invested, but merely take the beautifully illustrated guidebook away and give it some thought. It was like a timeshare presentation. No obligation to buy. Only the obligation to give it some thought. You take yourself home and forget about the dashing white kernel for the evening. But when you come down to breakfast the next day, there it is. That guidebook, written by one Captain Thomas Strangeways. You pick up the morning paper and there's a piece about this incredible land of Poye and the opportunity for glory and wealth that it offers its investors and colonists. Everywhere you go that day there seems to be someone talking about Poye and occasionally the cacique. You return to your home and you devour this leather-bound guidebook. You have to understand what's happening. Maybe this Gregor McGregor has actually come good. It certainly seems like it. You close the book by candlelight and resolve that a little investment couldn't hurt anyone. For his part, Gregor McGregor is delighted with this attention and is well on his way to raising £200,000 to take Poye from idyllic backwater to powerhouse of the British Empire. There's just one problem. Poye doesn't exist. Yes, McGregor does own a huge area of land on the Mosquito Coast, but everything else, right down to the name and his own title, they're all made up. Those reports in the newspaper, fake. The paintings and etchings of a bustling port with stunning palms and friendly settlers, forgeries. The guidebook by Thomas Strangeways, a work of fiction written under a pseudonym by Gregor McGregor. Your money is going into a black hole of debauchery and lies. Over the course of his life, the land certificates which McGregor issued as proof of investments were worth as much as three billion pounds in today's money. The certificates, initially handwritten and later printed for huge swathes of a prosperous nation that didn't exist, were quite literally not worth the paper they were printed on. He dispatched a fleet of settlement ships to the port of Poye. Gregor MacGregor, the cacique of Poye, sent seven ships of settlers, excited for a better life to a dead spot in the middle of a swampy, disease-ridden jungle. Their pockets full of Poye dollars, a paper currency which MacGregor himself had printed. The settlers handed over all of their British money for worthless sheets of paper. It didn't take them long to realise that they'd been duped. There was no economy in Poye. There was nothing to buy. And there was nobody to buy that nothing from. The settlers almost immediately began to contract disease and had to be rescued. By the time they returned home, many were so unable to believe that they had been the victims of a lie, they blamed the leaders of the expedition. The cacique of Poye had disappeared. 
He was in France, but he wasn't in hiding. He was raking in another small fortune convincing the elites of Paris that the mystical land of Poyet was the pinnacle of French sophistication. Settlers began to make applications for passports to travel there, but something didn't sit right with the authorities in France. Why were so many people looking for permission to go to a country which, as far as they could tell, didn't exist? It led them to the door of Gregor MacGregor, the crown prince of lies, the progenitor of securities fraud, the greatest con man the world has ever seen. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. The music for every episode of Scotland is by the Copiali cipher Mitch Bain. Find more of his amazing tracks by searching Mitch Bain Music on Facebook. Scotland is supported by listeners like Chris Lingwood, our first ever $25 a month patron, and other listeners like you over on Patreon. Get involved. It's patreon.com slash Scotland history podcast. You can find out more about the show on our website, this is scotland.co, and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by searching Scotland, Scottish History Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.